Dear community, welcome to the third episode of the EBS Symposium podcast. Today we had the pleasure to talk to Niklas Nink, an EBS alumnus who went through various positions and is now the team of sales for Germany and Austria at Edmund de Rothschild. We talked about his time at EBS and what he remembers about the EBS Symposium from back then and how he finally ended up at EDR. Enjoy listening and have fun. Dear community, welcome to our third episode of the EBS Symposium podcast. Today we are delighted to have Niklas Nink, team head of sales in Germany and Austria and executive director in Edmund Rothschild. Hello Niklas, it's great to have you with us today. How are you? Very well, Thank, thanks for coming over to Frankfurt. Yeah. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, first of all, thanks for having us at your office today. It's a great view, it's nice offices. Before we dive deeper in our discussion, um, why don't you introduce yourself to our community in a bit more detail? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad, glad to introduce myself. Uh, as, as you already said, working for Edmund Rothschild for nearly two years now. I started studying at EPS uh, in 2012, doing my undergrad in general management and subsequently also my real estate finance master at EBS before coming along to Bordeaux doing my double degree at Catch Business School and ultimately ended up in asset management and investment management with Fidelity International in London before joining EDR here in Frankfurt in 2022, predominantly looking after family offices and okay. corporate pensions here in Germany and Austria. Very interesting. As you already mentioned, um, you as an EBS alumnus, um, what are maybe some pivotal moments you remember from your time uh, at EBS? When did you start at EBS? And um, maybe do you call uh, or do you recall any symposium that stood out in your time when you were there? <laughs> um, I, I think and that's one of the things that makes EBS so, so special to me when thinking back Obviously, it's a great academic foundation you, you get, but thinking back to EBS most likely brings up personal memories and memories of friendship and a really good time as a, as a student there, which also is the fact for the symposium, because coming to EBS, you're basically confronted with the symposium yeah. on day one. You get involved with really boots on the groundwork, you start helping out cleaning the campus, yeah. <laughs> all of the things that come along. And my very first symposium was obviously as, as a freshman starting yeah. there. And I remember having a really good closing party and then being scheduled to clean up the campus yeah. the very next day. And as bad as that may sound, you had a lot of good friendship starting yeah. along with those yeah. first experiences actually. No. Yeah, that's something not too unfamiliar for us as well, because that's <laughs> also how I got into in touch with the symposium. I remember, um, I'm pretty sure it was the same back then, this whole pacing system. And that's also I was, we moved last year for the first time to the Kurs in Wiesbaden, hosting the symposium there because of the construction work um, on the campus. And then I remember it was super busy waking up at 5 a.m., getting to Wiesbaden and then doing some last minute um, work to get everything done. But that was something also that stood out for me. Everybody was working hands on for one greater goal to achieve this great Congress. And that's also how I made my decision in the end to be part of the symposium. I mean, it's lovely to hear that this uh, development uh, was always the same. And then you already mentioned as well, you later pursued your master's in real estate and finance. What motivated you to stay at EBS and specialize in real estate? Why didn't you go abroad as many other people do? What made you want to stay? Admittingly, I initially did not intend to end up in the financial industry yeah. when doing my undergrad at EBS. But, and that's also really thing I cherish about EBS is basically you get confronted with real life working environment mm -hmm. from your first internship onwards and I, I happened to 
be a working student for a real estate consultancy firm in my yeah. fifth semester. Really enjoyed working in the industry and realized, okay, I might want to specialize in, in real estate. That basically made me decide in between a few options offering that kind of master program mm -hmm. and apps happened to be one of the predominant players in the real estate field when it comes to master education. Yeah. So I basically did not intend to stay, but basically had to decide on a really good program, which made me choose apps for, for real estate finance, which I didn't regret at all. Great. Um, and we got some colleagues, of course, in our real estate master. What was it like back then? Because from what I know today, I think it's like a one year program on the campus at EBS. And then after your first year, you go to a different city, explore some construction sites, and then you have one year abroad where you have, uh, where you're studying at a different university and have time to do your master thesis. So um, the master's program yeah. was designed to be one year long in real estate mm -hmm. finance. Okay. And um, there was the option to basically extend to mm. a double degree. So I had a lot of, a lot of colleagues not going abroad. There were many case studies offered by real life examples. Yeah. So we were basically tasked to evaluate and do a full-blown valuation on the Skyper, for example, in collaboration with the, at that time, owner Deutsche Bank, which mm -hmm. was a really good experience for us. And also basically gave a really good transparency on real life scenarios. We had a field trip together with um, the owner of a logistics site in, in Hamburg, which at that time was uh, Auto Group, so the big yeah. warehouse and catalog sales program. And they were rethinking how to basically use this logistics yeah. area using us as students to basically come up with creative ideas, and it was a really good competition to basically bring up the best ideas there. Yeah, And all that was really, really enriching, also working mm -hmm. now in a similar field, even though not only real estate, but it really showcased future future real life scenarios. But um, then you chose the option to do a double degree? Yes. Yeah, and where did you go abroad? I went uh, to France, to Bordeaux. Oh, okay, that was um, the part of... Yeah, that was okay. the, the double degree part. And admittingly, I went there because I wanted to study in a bigger city. So, I mean, you all guys know how yeah. life in, in, <laughs> in Rheingau is. It's, it's nice, it's a picturesque city, but in the end... <laughs> You want to see big city life as a student as well. I mean, Bordeaux, let's say mid-sized city life. But yeah. Um, yeah, that basically was my intention next to learning a bit of French. Yeah, interesting because, um, I mean, for me as well, um, we just had to vote our exchange universities, as you might remember from your bachelors. And um, I somehow also ended up in, in France. I'm going to Nice, but... Um, yeah, also not something that I expected, to be honest, ending up in France. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my, my undergrad experience was a bit more exotic. I yeah? opted for uh, Morocco, so I went to Morocco. Casablanca. Oh, I think that's something uh, we're not able to do anymore. Yeah, that might be due to my experience there. So I was the first and last suit going going to, to Casablanca. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, it, it's, it's a completely different setup, so it's feeling much more like school, less yeah. like university even though it's been really culturally yeah. enriching experience it probably is not the the standard you would expect from a european university when 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 going there so a much more basic level of education oh okay so and then afterwards morocco yeah i, I don't think it exists okay <laughs> university okay but then um let's move on from that um you mentioned you weren't actually planning on ending up in in the finance sector at first but um, then you spend significant time at fidelity in vienna london and frankfurt um, how did you initially end up there and can you give us some insights in the different roles you held there yeah um, first of all why did i end up in in finance i think Studying real estate obviously brings you more towards the, the financial industry yeah. and Fidelity's offering to 
start off as a graduate in London, mm -hmm. not only being fixed to the location of London, but getting the chance to see different hubs, different branches of the firm, and also different departments was, was really intriguing to me. Yeah. So that's why I actually decided on leaving pure real estate for, for this investment mm -hmm. management company. And what Fidelity really does well is bringing together talent, not only from business background and not only from finance masters, yeah. but people really interesting to learn bring them together. I had a lot of colleagues starting out from history studies or philosophy backgrounds, yeah. basically becoming equity research analysts mm -hmm. at Fidelity. I got the chance to see the distribution side of things in Vienna and Vienna within Fidelity has a special spot because it's not only covering the Austrian market, but also looking after Eastern Europe. Okay which is a really young and dynamic market mm -hmm. compared to the more established and conservative approach you see in the rest of Central Europe. Within my time there, I also got to see the investment side and the fixed income team mm -hmm. in London, which was also really, really exciting to see, given the fact that you have not only British colleagues, yeah. but a team of 10 people could easily be nine different nationalities, yeah. Greece, Israel. <laughs> Spain and a lot of young and really, really motivated yeah. and much smarter people than, than I ever met before being in one room, really, really working on, on common projects. And that was a really, really good experience. But then mentioning that the Eastern European market is much younger, what were the key differences you faced um, working in, in London on the more established markets and then maybe in Austria on those younger emerging markets? The main difference really is the way you try to do business. So mm -hmm. taking UK or Germany as an example, yeah. the growth rate of the overall market for the asset management industry is by far not the same than in Eastern Europe. In Eastern mm -hmm. Europe, pension schemes start to emerge and additional wealth for people just starts to pick up speed. So you basically are not competing for existing market yeah. share, but try to just track the momentum yeah. the market is taking. And then at the same time, due to the market still being young and in its emerging phase, you were also having a completely different demographic of clients. So yeah. the usual pension fund manager here in Germany will be somewhere around 50, 55, doing the job for the last 30 years, being really established in Czech Republic yeah. or Hungary, for example, it might be a 20-something-year-old guy or beginning of 30-year-old guy just starting off to set up the processes and structures mm -hmm. in need for, for, that, yeah. for that pension scheme. And even though there's a lot of things already in place, it's still a lot of moving parts that can be, can be developed from an asset management company. And hence, it's been a really interesting time to see my colleagues on the ground there, we had a Hungarian colleague mm -hmm. covering the, the market from Budapest. Yeah. We had a Polish colleague really shaping the industry there. Fidelity has more than 50% cross-border market share in Hungary, for example, which is unheard of in any other market. I mean, it's single digits here in Germany yeah. and it's nowhere near that 50% <laughs> for any other asset manager. No, yeah, that's interesting. And then... In March 2022, I think you transitioned from Fidelity to your new role at um, EDR. Um, what made you move from Fidelity? Because from, from my, uh, what I hear, it sounded like a great experience. But what made you want to do this, this next step and, and move on? You know, and, and I think it's, it's always the same. If, you, if you're young, you yeah. basically don't want to commit to the same place for all of your of course. life. So yeah. basically I was not actively looking to move, but considering new options. And in the end it was my now boss making me mm -hmm. join the firm. I, I was interviewing with, with Goldman Sachs at the time yeah. and Regina Wiedmann, who's now heading up the branch here for EDR at, mm -hmm. in Germany, interviewed me while she still was at Goldman, coming back to me two or three weeks later saying, The interview was really nice. I consider going to, to EDR, 
would you come along? And that's probably the one thing I, I really learned in the last years being employed in the industry. It's less about the company you work for and more about the people you actually work for or work with because having someone really putting you in a spot where you can show what you can and basically yeah. perform and people really believing in you is much more important than than having a like fancy employer <laughs> and that also was an experience with the with infidelity so yeah. i was lucky enough to have people as my bosses who were really supportive really knowledgeable and that you were able to learn a lot from and that actually made me move because i was really intrigued to actually mm -hmm. work with Regine here on building up the branch in Germany. It's very interesting because I also think that's some something what our younger generation really narrows down on, like having this big name on your CV, but focusing less on the people you actually work with. But then for our listeners who might be not as familiar with what uh, EDR does, can you maybe just give, you, uh, give us a quick overview of what you specialize in or what, yes. what yeah. topics you cover. Happy to. And that's actually the very first task that I have also in the interaction with clients because yeah. the name Rothschild is known. I mean, everyone course, has yeah. heard about that, that family starting off in the financial industry 250 years yeah. ago. There's a distinction to be made between Edmond Rothschild and Rothschild and Co. Yeah. Both originate from the same founding father, Maya Amschel de Rothschild, mm -hmm. setting up the business here in Frankfurt 250 years ago. And while Rothschild and Co. is operating the famous and renowned investment banking business next to private banking and wealth management mm -hmm. services, EDR is here in Germany fully focused on asset management services. So we're not looking after private individuals like the private bank maybe is doing. We do that outside of Germany and the rest of yeah. Europe. But here in Germany, we focus on servicing institutional clients, i.e. insurance companies, yeah. pension funds, single family offices, and cater them individual tailor-made investment solutions, predominantly in the infrastructure space, mm -hmm. also offering them real estate equity, real estate debt solutions, private equity solutions, as well as public market solutions that can be equity funds, fixed income funds, yeah. or for example, overlay mandates in the, in the FX space. And my daily task basically mm -hmm. would be to explain these products to institutional clients, convincing them to trust us yeah. with a significant amount of money that we'll be investing on their behalf. Well, that's interesting. And um, as you already mentioned that you're also advising them in the infrastructure space, um, recently Edmund de Rothschild has announced a partnership with What our partners in SMB Capital to launch an infrastructure product, uh, infrastructure debt strategy in Saudi Arabia. Um, can you tell us more about this initiative and it's important to the firms and what maybe each partner brings to the table? Yeah. So why is it important? First of all, infrastructure is a crucial element in value generation for us globally. And that starts off with mobility solutions that's including everything from your renewable energy onto social mm -hmm. solutions like hospitals, etc. And there's so much need for capital allocation in that space that private will only be one building block in, the, in that equilibrium. And we see it as a duty as an asset manager to actually contribute to it towards these investments. Hence, the family always has been really involved in infrastructure investments. And it's not only a socioeconomic need, but also quite interesting from an investment perspective. The Rothschild family itself has been involved for decades. Mm -hmm. They have financed part of the European railway system. They have financed the Suez Canal. 
and in the last 10 years, not only acted as an advisor, but also as an investor for external money. Here in Europe, we're number three when it comes to European debt asset managers. Mm -hmm. And most of the other asset managers in Europe have a balance sheet to invest from the insurance side. So hence, we're one of the few independent asset managers really being able to select the projects we deem suitable. Yeah. And this kind of knowledge obviously is not only of crucial interest in Europe, but also more and more relevant in, in the Middle East. There's a need for investment, whereas Saudi Arabia and Middle East is less in need of capital and more <laughs> in need of actual knowledge and capabilities yeah. to structure these projects. It's been a good synergy to basically bring up SMB capital together with the really established and credible infrastructure investment track record mm -hmm. like we have at EDR. And hence, I, th I think it's a good enhancement to our current European setup. Interesting. And then maybe making another step, um, reflecting on your role and the latest developments, what insights can you maybe share about the evolving dynamic between this whole digital transformation um, process and the traditional sales methods between financial structures, any major shifts you experience when it comes to AI or something like that? <laughs> no, that's, that's a really good question because I really like how the industry as a general is perceiving these trends as really yeah. important and then looking into the actual <laughs> machine room of each and every asset manager <laughs> and bank you see that there's so many old established processes yeah. <laughs> that still run on really old systems and i think the industry is really ripe for disruption there mm -hmm. has been first attempts to do so if you look four or five years back everyone yeah. was talking about robot advisories everyone was basically sure that the typical inter intermediary sales process yeah. as it currently still operates with the likes of distribution banks or IFA mm -hmm. networks selling the products to the end client would be disrupted by digital platforms offering discretionary managed portfolios to the end client. Yeah. That has not really happened. And the industry is really reluctant to real innovation and change is only coming very very slow and i mean there's some exceptions like the expansion and exponential growth of a bitcoin etf for mm -hmm. example but the overall structures and distribution processes as they are currently is very much similar to the 90s and it's probably up for the next generation like you guys to basically think of ways to really improve and speed up the process yeah. There's first platforms like Trade Republic mm -hmm. already going in the right direction, but there's so much more to be done. That's and I mean, talking about artificial intelligence yeah. would only be the next step. Like there's, <laughs> even with current technology available, there's so much that, that can be done, but is still not implemented. Yeah. No, of course. Um, thank you for sharing those insights. Maybe for somebody else who's planning on pursuing a similar career, maybe even from somebody who wasn't initially planning on actually getting into this field, what is some advice you would give to the younger generation? And my advice basically would be to not only follow the standard paths that you and your classmates would be considering in the beginning. I mean, for an EBS student, typically you would go down the route of consulting and investment banking. Yeah. Maybe there's venture capital investing and becoming a startup founder on top of that. But there's so many really interesting and probably even more promising careers out there that should be considered by, by younger generations. But my hint would be, obviously, I mean, you can't do anything wrong by going down the big consultancy yeah. firms or starting <laughs> off to work at an investment bank but really considering the content of your work rather than the than the CV sticker you get yeah. when, when joining a firm. Yeah. 
okay but um of course we have a young audience who's of course also interested in uh, in getting maybe this cv sticker as you said and of course um edr is a very prestigious name in the industry um what is maybe interesting for our audience what is the kind of profile you're looking for maybe interns or recent graduates uh, at EDR? We, we're always looking and I can only <laughs> ask you guys to apply because we are constantly having two interns here on a permanent basis okay. for five to six months. And we're really looking for someone that fits into the culture and we try to keep the culture a bit younger than the typical mm -hmm. investment management firm. <laughs> But we were looking for someone genuinely interested. It doesn't really matter whether he has previous experience in asset management. For yeah. us, it really matters whether he wants to or she wants to learn and really grow into some some part of ownership within that period of time he or she works with us here. Okay. And then what is something an, an intern can, can expect when, when interning uh, here at ADR? I mean, we're a comparably small team here, so yeah. we're 15 people, and all of our interns in the past basically got the chance to see the full value chain mm -hmm. of the German team here. That obviously starts off with really mundane tasks like preparing and <laughs> printing and binding presentation <laughs> material for a pitch, but that includes participating in some of the clients' events that yeah includes participating in some of the strategic initiatives and thinking around how to actually position the firm within the next three years. And due to that small size, it's basically becoming a full integrated colleague within the team. And is from all what I've heard from our pr uh, past interns, something they, they, they really enjoy. Great. Okay, then... Um Thank you so much for your time today, Niklas. I think there were some some really good um, uh, advices we can we can learn of. Um, maybe any any last words from your side? No, nothing, nothing particular. <laughs> I would say just continue what you are doing with the with the EBS symposium, and yeah. I think it's it's great to see that this tradition is constantly held up on yeah. and um, I mean, we'd love to have you there uh, in september <laughs> i don't know if it's possible for i'll, you, I'll see what i can do <laughs> and uh, yeah best best of success in september i think cool house is a more than yeah, it's a great suitable place. replacement yeah. for for being on campus i mean that's yeah it brings up a lot nice of uh, a lot of challenges to be honest as well but it's it's a great location yeah. okay but then thank, thank you for you your time much. today and um, we'll see us in the next time Thank you. Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed our talk to Niklas and got something valuable from his advice for students trying to break into finance related positions. Also don't miss out on our next episode, which will be released from two weeks from now and follow us on our social media accounts. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>